Ready for the word? Yeah. All right. So, uh, been doing the, uh, the Tabernacle of Moses for, you know, several years now. And uh, <laughs> anyway, it's, it's an awesome thing, though. There's so much in there because God speaks in pictures, God speaks in symbols, right? So he can tell, you know, the little story of pictures is worth a thousand words. And true enough, the Tabernacle of Moses, what God told Moses to make 3,500 years ago, gave him the example up on the mountain, 40 days with God, showed him how to build this tabernacle. And everything in it is highly symbolic of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, everything he's done for us and our relationship with him. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, so, and I've, and I've really gone pretty shallow in it. We could have gone a lot, we got a lot longer and literally spent, you know, months and months and months, but, but uh, we stayed, you know, fairly shallow, just kind of trying to keep it relatable to us today as much as possible. Uh, and then uh, the, the, finally, the, the place you come to in the, in the ark, or sorry, in the uh, tabernacle is the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat. <laughs> That's awesome stuff. Can we show the, there we go. That's an artist, artist rendering there, a model of the Ark of the Covenant, which is essentially a box made of wood and covered with gold, and then a cover, and which has uh, two angels or cherubim on it. Uh, that, that cover, the mercy seat is what it's called, sits on the Ark. Uh, which is like the box there, and then these angels are made out of one piece of, of solid gold and hammered work and, and uh, made to represent uh, angels covering the throne of God. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing. The, the Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of God lived, right? Right above the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, in the Tabernacle of Moses, the Tabernacle in the midst of the people of Israel, God wanted to live in the middle of his people. And the reason for that is really, really simple. If you love somebody, you want to be close to them. <laughs> it's plain and simple. God said, I'm gonna, I'm, I love you and I'm, I choose you. You're my people and I'm going to live in the midst of you. So here's how you build the tabernacle and I will literally, my presence will dwell inside this place. Right? But of course there was a separation because of holy God and fallen man. Right? So there was this separation kind of thing. And, and uh, and one of my favorite messages is, is on this progression. When I, well, it's an evangelistic message I give in other countries sometimes, the progression of the temple, right? Because uh, under Moses, there was this tabernacle, and God lived there in the middle of his people, but there's a separation, right? Holy God, fallen people. And then God said, that's good, but it's not quite good enough. So uh, later on, 2,000 years ago, uh, he became, God became the man Jesus Christ. Right? And there's this cool little verse in John uh, where Jesus said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And he was prophesying about the cross and the resurrection, but he called himself the temple. Basically, God went from a tabernacle of Moses as his temple to a human body as his temple. Right? The, te the body of Jesus was carrying the presence of God around, and, and the, the, basically the, that's a step closer, right? If you love somebody, you want to be close to them, so that's a step closer. And Jesus was able to talk, touch people and heal people and talk to people and love people, right? And then God said, that's pretty good, but it's not quite good enough. So after Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, rose from the dead, then God said, I'm going to get a little bit closer. I'm going to live inside of you. <laughs> and the New Testament, New Covenant says that now we are his temple. God lives in us. Because if you love somebody, you want to get close to them. Amen. <laughs> God said, I'm going to get as close as you can get. I'm going to live inside of you by invitation only. <laughs> right? If you invite me, I will come. Right? And uh, amen. so now we, are the, now we are the temple. And, uh, this, and everything in here, though, symbolizes our life in Christ. And it's, it's just, it's so beautiful. It's so rich. It's, there's so much in it that you could literally spend years studying it. It's an amazing thing. Uh, so the, uh, let, me, let me see. Read Exodus 25, please, uh, 10 through 22. We're going to read it quickly, but uh, there's just a couple of things in there I want to get to. It says, that, uh, you shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, a cubit and a half its height. Again, and you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it, shall make on it a molding of gold all around. So again, we have the wood and the gold, don't we? And we know from many of the articles in the, in the tabernacle that the wood represented human nature, the gold is divine nature. You put God and man together and it's Jesus. So this also represents Jesus in some way. Go ahead. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners, two rings on one side, two rings on the other. Keep going. And you shall make poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them. They weren't to touch it with their hands. They're to carry it on these poles only. And keep going. Oh, the poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. All right. 
I want to read the whole passage, but there's a couple of points I'm really looking for. And you shall put it into the ark. Put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. This is interesting. There was three things that were going to end up going in this ark. Okay? Some of you probably know what they are. One was the Ten Commandments, eh? actually written by the finger of God on two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments placed inside of this ark of the covenant. And there they stayed. Uh, and then the other thing, one was manna. Remember when Israel was coming out of Egypt on the way to the promised land and they had no food, but God said, every morning you wake up, there will be manna on the ground, right? And it was uh, bread from heaven, right? They could eat it. It was fresh every morning. They had to eat it the same day. It only stayed fresh for one day, right? And uh, God said, put some of that man in a jar and put it in the ark uh, of the covenant. And there it stays. And there it stays fresh. Day after day, year after year, decade after decade, century after century, the manna stayed fresh inside the ark of the covenant because that's where the presence of God was and nothing gets old in the presence of God. <laughs> Eternal life, right? <laughs> nothing decays, nothing corrupts, and they're in the presence of God, right? The full-on manifested presence, amen. And then there was one other thing that was in there. It was a rod, a, a, a stick, essentially a rod, you know, of wood that, uh, that was from uh, Aaron and there's a long story that goes with that, but essentially God uh, showed that he, Aaron was the chosen priesthood, right? And, and he took Aaron's rod and laid it inside again, inside the tabernacle, inside the Holy of Holies by the Ark of the Covenant. And the next morning, Aaron's rod, which was just a, a stick, just a dead stick. The next morning it budded and it had almond flowers and almonds and leaves and <laughs> right, supernaturally um, blood, budded and flowered. And then they put that, God said, put that in the Ark of the Covenant also. And there it stayed with its green leaves, with its flowers and with its almond fruit. Year after year, decade after decade, century after century for a very long time did not decay, did not get old because in the presence of God, nothing decays and gets old. That's what heaven's like, by the way, <laughs> right? Oh. Amen. And so, you know, those things speak of, of course, uh, it, representing Jesus, the, the Ten Commandments speaks about the law of God in his heart, right? And then the, uh, the manna represents the presence of God as our food to feed upon. And then the, the uh, budded rod uh, represents resurrection life. It was dead, but it supernaturally produced leaves, fruit, and, and flowers. And it represents the resurrection. Hallelujah. And so... Uh, let's see, keep going. Uh, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. And you shall make ch two cherubim of gold, of hammered work you shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. These are angels, make one cherub at one end, the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it, of one piece with the mercy seat. I'll show you something about that in a second. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. They shall face one another, the faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. Stop there for a second. Um, look at, look at, jump all the way up to, where's uh, John chapter 20. This is so interesting. You, you already saw the picture, right? The mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant, these two angels. And what you uh, probably need to know also is that this Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat represents the throne of God. Truly, that's, when you study it out, it represents the throne of God. And we know that partially because, I'm not going to put it on the screen, it would take way too long. Isaiah 6 gives a, a description of the prophet Isaiah. He visits heaven, right? He sees God on his throne. And he says that there above the Lord was cherubim with their wings stretched out over the presence of God, right? And then in Ezekiel chapter 1, there was these same cherubim, or you call them living creatures, they're angels. And, and in Ezekiel chapter 1, it describes them again, and their wings were stretched out facing each other over the presence of God. Right? Very, very interesting. And then in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, those same, you know, John, the apostle John visits heaven, and he sees those same cherubim with their wings stretched out over the presence of God each time, right? And did you see the picture of the mercy seat? The, <laughs> yeah, right, with the two angels with their wings spread out. Go ahead, and then which one did I say in John, uh, what was it? John 20? Yeah, verse 11 and 12. Right at the, right at the resurrection, uh, it says that Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. She thinks Jesus is dead inside, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. <laughs> what? <laughs> 
Those angels covered the presence of God. Those cherubim always covered the presence of God, right? And right there where Jesus had lain, there they were, one at each end, the same thing, the same thing. And I remember years ago when I was a new Christian, and uh, there was some lady, and I don't remember where, when, I don't remember most of it, but I remember I was in some Bible study somewhere, and some lady was a really good Bible teacher. She was teaching this, and she read that verse, and I flipped out. I'm like, wow, God, you are genius. Like, it's all tied together, right? It's all about Jesus. <laughs> and it would just, boom. You know. And the, those little details that the Bible just, you know, God just drops there in the Bible and says, ah, you'll see it sometime. You'll figure it out, <laughs> you know? Amazing stuff, isn't it? Because uh, what is that saying? That Jesus is Jehovah God. Because <laughs> those angels always covered the throne of Jehovah God. And there they are covering him. And that also shows that the, the shed blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the death and resurrection, is the mercy seat. It is the mercy seat where those angels are there. That's what it's all about, right? And once a year, the high priest of Israel would take the blood of a sacrifice in to the Holy of Holies, place it on the mercy seat, but he had to do it year after year after year. When Jesus did it, once and for all, it was done. Amen. Amazing stuff, right? Jump back to Exodus 25. Uh, where were we? 21 and 22, I think. It says, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. Again, the, the Ten Commandments, the budded rod, and the manna. Go ahead. And then, this is the, the coolest part of the whole thing, Exodus 25, 22. And God said, there I will meet with you. He's talking to Moses, by the way. He said, there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to, chil to the children of Israel. This is really interesting, again, because if you, if you read the, you know, the whole law of Moses, the only person who was legally authorized to go into the Holy of Holies was the high priest once a year, right, which is Aaron first and then descendants of Aaron, and they could go once a year only to go in there with the blood of a sacrifice on behalf of all Israel and then to be repeated one year later. And the rest of the time, no access to the Holy of Holies. Nobody goes in, period. <laughs> right? And then, however, there was one exception to this rule, it was Moses. God said, you can come in anytime you want to. <laughs> come on in, and I'll, this is where I'll talk with you. Come on anytime, anytime you want to, or I'll call you or whatever. We'll meet there, and I'll talk with you there. <laughs> That's pretty interesting, yeah. And you can see that it's also uh, confirmed, Numbers 789. I think I have that one there. It says, uh, later on, it says, when they, when they actually built the tabernacle, dedicated the tabernacle there, uh, it says, when Moses went into the tabernacle of meeting to speak with God, he heard the voice of one speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the Ark of the Testimony, from between the two cherubim. Thus he spoke to him. So when the temple was, tabernacle was dedicated, that's the first time Moses went in there and God said, all right, let's meet here. So let's talk. <laughs> Moses, uh, what's that about? Um, Moses represents us, access to the Holy of Holies, the Ark of God's presence, anytime he wants to. Right? In the New Covenant, that represents us. That, uh, in fact, what gets really even cooler than that, if we're the temple, of course, if we are the tabernacle now, all of this is inside of us, right? The Holy of Holies is in us. That's your spirit man inside of you. God's throne room is inside of you. There's also literally a throne room somewhere, but in God's amazing way of breaking all the physical rules and all the rules of nature and you know, physics and everything else, God also has his throne room literally inside of you now. <laughs> right, and, that's, and his presence is there inside of you, and you have access to talk to him. Anytime you want to, God says, that's where you meet with me, that's where I'll talk to you. <laughs> so his throne room is inside of you, but you're also inside of his throne room, which is a literal place. <laughs> right? You're there, and, well, you get it, right? That's why Jesus said all those great, amazing things like, in that day you will know that I am in you, and you are in me, and he meant it, right? <laughs> he meant it quite literally. <laughs> you're, oh, Wow. Your spirit, just absorb the idea that your spirit is now the throne room of God, right, for every single one of us. How cool is that? And we're also seated with the Lord on his, on his throne, amen? And we, we know that Ephesians 1.20 and Ephesians 2.4-6 to uh, says that, is talking here about, in the New Covenant, about the power of God, which he worked in Christ when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus was seated at the right hand of the Father in the resurrection. Amen. And then in chapter 2, verse 4 to 6, it tells us also that God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. 
and verse 6, and he raised us up together. That's you and me. And he made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So again, what I, what I love about this verse, this verse tells you that you are now, right now, seated at the right hand of God, right? At the right hand of the Father in heaven. You're seated there now. You truly, literally are there. Your spirit, that's where you're seated. And at the very, very same time, God's throne room is also inside of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, the, when you talk about the, 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 uh, the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, this is something that really people have, have, have studied, and there's, there's layers of meaning and symbolism that you can actually spend a semester and study the thing for hours and 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 hours and, hours and, hours and see all this. I've got like 40 minutes with you, <laughs> right? And so but it's, it, it represents the throne of God, right? But the tabernacle now represents you, and he's inside of you, but you're also seated with him. In, in heaven, which is a literal place. And you, you might see where this is going, right? You might see where this is going. Because what, really what this is headed towards, um, I'm still not happy with how I've got this. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Is that what it is? This one? I'm sorry. You're right. That's what it is. I'm really sorry there. Okay. Oh, that's better. Now I won't make everybody crazy. Okay. <laughs> Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So the tabernacle, remember, it, we're studying it as a symbol of our growth in Christ, right? Our progress in Christ. So the very, very first thing as a Christian, you come to the cross of Jesus, right? You don't go any farther without coming to the cross, the shed blood, forgiveness of sins. That's represented again by the, the altar of sacrifice, right? In the tabernacle. And where Israelites would sacrifice animals for forgiveness of sins. And then the next thing you go to is that wash basin, right? Which says in Ephesians 5, represents washing of water by the word, which is the word washes our mind cleanses our mind. It's the Bible is the next step. You begin to learn God's word, right? First the cross, then the Bible. Begin to learn. Then you step into the holy place and now there's that lampstand, the golden lampstand, which represents God supernaturally giving you guidance and understanding and revelation and illumination in your soul. Right? And, and then we begin to experience that as a Christian. And then on the other side of the holy place is that table of showbread, right? So the next stage in our growth as a Christian is you begin to really experience the presence of God and feed on the presence of God, right? That showbread of his presence. And then after that is the altar of incense, which we studied the last couple of weeks. It represents worship and prayer, right? So the next thing in your Christian progress is you become a person of worship and you become a person of prayer, right? And that becomes part of who you are and what you do. And you become one of those kind of a priest of God in a sense. And, uh, but then ultimately you step through in, in your Christian progress, you step into the Holy of Holies. And what I'm really saying is you're already there. The moment you're saved, it, you're already there. It's already yours. However, in our, in our progress, in our understanding, you begin to experience what is the Holy of Holies and the Ark and the Mercy Seat. You begin to experience the throne room of God. Begin to, begin to experience what that means, that the throne of God is inside of you, the manifest presence of God is inside of you, the dominion of God, the glory of God, right? the authority of God, the power of God, all living inside of you now, right? And that begins to become part of your awareness. This is really what I'm going after here, is that tonight, the point I want to make more than anything, is that you're, you're, you're kind of this, the next place in your Christian progress is you become aware of the presence of God with you um, progressively. The ultimate goal is to be aware at all times of his presence with you. I'm not there yet. How about you? <laughs> right? Times I'm very aware of God's presence with me and other times I completely forget. Eh? It's a good TV show on, whatever. And, but, but we get to the place where you, the presence of God becomes part of your consciousness all the time, right? Jesus modeled that. Jesus lived that every moment of his life and ministry. Right? That's why everything he did, everything he said, was, was the presence of the Father living inside of him and him in awareness and consciousness of the presence of the Father inside of him and he's living out of that place, right? Um, you see where I'm going with this? Right? This, is, this is really, yeah, the, what the Ark of the Covenant for me is, is living in this, this awareness and this partnership with his presence, God living inside of you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, if you want to put it that way. Um, there's, there's a really interesting verse, Romans 8, 11, um, if, if God's living inside of you, and he is, uh, and I'm, I'm just kind of pulling some, yeah, Romans 8, 11, pulling some fun thoughts together here. Do I have that one in the lineup there? Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah. So Romans 8, 11, it's talking about the resurrection, right? And about the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and he's talking about the resurrection. And it says, that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, does he? Yeah. Yes. Then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Again, we're the temple now, we're the tabernacle, he lives inside of us. But the, the cool thought about this is when, you know, when it's time for the resurrection, right, and the trumpet blows... And it's resurrection time. Where does the resurrection power come from? Does it come from heaven or does it come from inside of you? It's right there inside of you right now. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's ready to resurrect you, give you an immortal body, a resurrected body. It'll take him about half a second to do it, right? The twinkling of an eye. It's a, he's waiting on that trumpet, right? He's waiting. So the, it, when the trumpet blows, it's not that, you know, the resurrection power falls from heaven. Some, it's right inside of you, boom, released in a moment, and you're, and you're made eternal, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're made, yeah. It's, it's amazing. Resurrection, glorified body. It's inside of you already, some of it's being released now. Some of it's waiting for that, for that final moment, right? It's an amazing thing. Uh, oh, let's see. <laughs> uh, John 14, 10 and 11. Okay. Still. Okay. So one of the things that I, that I really believe is that Jesus, you know, walked in this all the time, the awareness of the Father's presence inside of him, right? He's living as a man. Jesus is living as a man. Even though he is God incarnate, God with us, he's still living as a man to be our model, to be our example, right? And so he, everything Jesus does in his life and ministry, uh, especially in his ministry, those three years, three and a half years of his ministry, everything he does is from the presence of the Father within him, Right? Because he's living as a man, and he's modeling this for us. Everything he says, everything he does. And so this is really the, the, the Holy of Holies, Ark of the Covenant, mercy seat relationship, where Jesus is intensely aware and conscious of the Father's partnership all the time. He lives out of that place, right? Uh, he says it here in many different ways, and most of them are found in John 14, which is an amazing thing. In John 14, 10, Jesus said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? That's what we're talking about. That's the Ark of the Covenant mercy seat thing. His, that partnership, that communion, that union, that union with God and that awareness of that. Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. So Jesus really referred to two things, works and words, right? Or words and works. He said, it all comes from the Father within me. Well, aren't you God yourself? Yes, but I'm living as a man. Everything I'm doing, modeling it for you, everything I say and do is from the presence of the Father within me. <laughs> right? And I'm modeling it for you. It's for you. It's for you, right? This is how you're going to live. This is how you're going to be. Right? I thought as a Christian I was just a forgiven sinner. Oh, no, you're so much more than that. You're a born-again person with God living inside of you, right? The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of His presence and His Shekinah glory presence is inside of you, right? And Jesus modeled that. He said there's, this, there's no limit, right, to the life you can live in Christ, right? You're not just a forgiven sinner going to heaven someday. Amen? There's no limit. It's how, how far do we want to go with God? You can go, right? How far do you want to, yeah, yeah. How much do you want to learn? How much do you want to walk in partnership with him? You can. It's all there. It's all for you. Uh, John 16, 32. Also, Jesus uh, said, indeed the hour is coming. Uh, yes has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. Right before the cross, right? He says to his disciples, you're all about to leave me. I'm looking at my watch. He had a watch. And you're all, <laughs> you're all about to scatter right now. You're all going to leave me alone. And then look what he says. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Where is he? Right inside of me. Huh? He's right inside of me. I'm never alone. I'm never alone. When you, when, you, when you progress into this place spiritually where you've gone through the rest of the tabernacle, kind of, right, you get the cross, you're forgiven, you're made righteous, right, you're clean. You've started to learn the Bible, you're renewing your mind and your thinking, and the Holy Spirit is illuminating you, giving you revelation and personal guidance, and you're aware of that, you're sensitive to that, and you feed on the bread of his presence, and you're a person of worship, and you're a person of prayer, and now you're a person who's become aware of the abiding presence of God inside of you, and you're living in union with communion with God, partnership with God, right? you've come to that place, then you know also you are never alone. 
exactly what Jesus said, you're never alone, right? And up till that point, there's times when as Christians we feel alone, right? Yeah. Right? Everybody, yeah, there's times when you feel very, very alone. It's, right? And like, God, where are you? You know? And that's just our feeling at the moment, but it's a real feeling at the moment, right? But yet, when you progress spiritually and, you, and you're understanding, God, you're with me all the time, like Jesus said, you get to the place where, well, I'm not alone. I know it. I feel it. You're with me all the time, God. This is real, right? No matter what I'm going through, I'm not alone. Right? And you never have to feel alone again, truly. But again, this is a progressive thing, isn't it, in our experience of it. The reality is yours the moment you're born again. But the experience of it progresses and grows. Right? Amen. So, yeah, you get to the place where you know you're not alone. You feel that. You feel his presence with you. You feel his support. You feel his love. Right? At John 5.20. Uh, Jesus said this also. Notice how much of this is in the Gospel of John. Jesus said, for the Father loves the Son. He's talking about himself, isn't he? And shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Isn't it awesome that Jesus just declared right out, oh, my Father loves me. The Father loves the Son. I know it. I count on it. I'm secure in it. I'm aware of it. Right? And I want to let you know about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. And what is that? Well, that's great for Jesus. What does that have to do with me? Everything. Same thing, because he's living in you now, right? God, the Father, is living in you. And in fact, the entire Trinity, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, living inside of you right now, right? And you are that tabernacle, that temple, and the glory of God lives inside of you. And you can say the same thing. He is my Father. I am his son or daughter, right? And the Father loves me, and I know it. I'm not hoping, wondering, trying to earn it, trying to deserve it, trying to, good, to do good enough, right? I know that he is, loves me and he's with me. I count on it. I experience it. I live out of that place. That's my reality now. Again, you know, are we all the way there? Any of us? Probably not. But we're progressing, right? And the more you, when you come to the place as you know that God loves you and you live out of that awareness, that knowledge, you're living in this Ark of the Covenant, relation, right? You're living in that Holy of Holies relationship. Um, <laughs> John uh, <laughs> six, John six fifty seven. Jesus said, "As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me." We talked about that one recently. He is the bread of life, right? As we feed on His presence. But Jesus again, He said, "As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father." And again, He's live. He's living as a man. He's living in dependence on the Father as a man, as an example to us. So his every breath is feeding on the Father's presence, right? His every step in life is, and his every thought and his every move is feeding on the Father's presence. And that's, the, that's that throne room lifestyle again. It's the Holy of Holies, Ark of the Covenant lifestyle that we grow into is God is... A, all of my resources, everything I need is not found outside of myself. It's all found inside of me. It's inside of myself. It's all in the presence of God living inside of me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider, right? Abraham discovered that one. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He's not out there somewhere. He's living inside of me now. All the resources are inside of me. All of his love is inside of me. His power is inside of me, right? When you, when you kind of start to believe that and experience that, walk in that awareness, that confidence, that faith, right? That's throne room living, right? That's Ark of the Covenant living. You guys with me so far? Okay, all right. So, yeah, um, this is where God, Jesus is trying to get us to this place. Uh, it, I'll give you one more, John 10, 30. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Union, communion, right? One heart, one mind, one life, one purpose, right? And, and then, so again, yeah, that's awesome. But you're, you're God, the Father and God, the Son. Of course you're one. What does that have to do with us? 1 Corinthians 6. What's the verse I have there? Which one is it? First Corinthians six seventeen. That's it. Uh, seventeen. It didn't make it in the lineup yet either. Okay, it's coming. First Corinthians six seventeen tells us, uh, but he who is joined to the Lord is what? One spirit with him. This is the amazing thing. As as Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He's living as a man. But he says, I and the Father are one, and then. In the new covenant, it says, after the cross, the resurrection, and God coming to live inside of you now. It says, you can say the same thing. If, as you're joined to the Lord now, you are one spirit with God. 
What does that mean even? It means a whole lot of stuff, right? But it's the Ark of the Covenant throne room living, right? Again, it's, 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 it's that, that sense of God's in me, with me, always. This, I'm living out of this place now, right? I'm living out of the fact that God and I are one. I'm not a forgiven sinner just hoping to go to heaven someday, right? Or looking forward to the day I go to heaven. That's not who I am, right? I'm one spirit with Jesus, one spirit with God now. I'm not God. He's God. I'm not. But he's made me one with him in a very real way that we live out of, right? Is, is that, uh, and for a lot of Christians, that thought is just so far away from their understanding. They're like, well, I'm just a forgiven sinner. I'm going to go to heaven when it's over. No, no, no. You're, God wants to live in union and communion with you in partnership with you and for you to live in an awareness of that. Right? Again, we, we don't get there in a week or a month or a year or 10 years. I mean, that's something we grow and we grow and we grow in year by year. It's an amazing thing. One spirit with the Lord, his nature inside of you, his power inside of you, his mission becomes your mission, his heart becomes your heart, right? His character becomes your character, his nature becomes your nature, right? His, you get it, right? <laughs> yeah, we have this and we're learning to live in an awareness of that. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you one story. Uh, Mark 4, 35 to 41. Um, this is the last uh, Bible passage I'm going to use, but, but there's this really cool story that I think illustrates a lot of what I'm trying to say here. It was during the ministry of Jesus uh, with his disciples. It says, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side, the other side of the, the sea, right, the lake. Okay. And how many know the story? Some of you do, yeah. Let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. Oh, how nice. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We are all going to die. <laughs> Wake up. And then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. <laughs> Keep going. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? What? <laughs> and, 41, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? <laughs> okay, this, this story, uh, I think, really illustrates exactly what I'm trying to talk about here, that Jesus living as a man in partnership with the Father, right? he's... Uh, he's living, the, he reacts to this situation out of that partnership, out of that inner partnership, okay? So let's go back and read uh, from verse uh, 35 again and just kind of get the, squeeze the juice out of everything here. So when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Whenever Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side, you know where you're going to end up? The other side, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the idea, right? Unless you jump out of the boat. If you jump out of the boat, it's your own fault, and then you don't get to the other side. <laughs> However, stay with Jesus, stay in the boat, you'll make it. Amen? All right, so, but if Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side, he's going, and you can go with him, right? <laughs> he is not going to sink in the middle. Now, this, this um, story can be, it's not just about crossing a lake, or it's, it's actually a small sea, a large lake, whatever, but... This is not just about crossing a body of water. This story is a metaphor on several levels okay, for, for our life in Christ. It can be a metaphor for the whole body of Christ. From the time Jesus died and rose to the time the trumpet blows and he comes back, 2,000-year church age, this thing can be a whole metaphor. After the cross and the resurrection, Jesus said, all right, everybody with me, let's go to the other side, meaning the church age, the kingdom, the full redemption, the full kingdom, right? If you're with me, if you stay in the boat, the boat's the church. Stay I mean the body of Christ, right? I don't mean the building necessarily, but stay with me, stay in the church, stay in the body of Christ. We're going to the other side. You stick me with me, you'll get there. All right, well, I'll get there. Just don't jump out of the boat. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and so it's a metaphor for that. It can also be a metaphor for how many know God has called you to accomplish something, become something, do something, right, And in our life. And so, or if that just simply means, you know, for you personally, making it to the kingdom and, you know, but it also might mean something God has called you to do, right? And Jesus said, come with me, let's go to the other side. What is, he didn't say, let's go halfway and die, right? Let's go halfway and then I'm going to let you down and the whole thing's going to fall apart. He didn't say that at all, right? He says, let's go to the other side, stick with me. Just don't jump out of the boat. Keep going. 
36. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. That's a good idea. Uh, and other little boats were also with him. Okay. We won't, we won't harp, stay, stay on that one. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. This is awesome. I love this. Because the moment Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side, you can almost guarantee there's a storm brewing. <laughs> right? <laughs> you can almost guarantee, right? Whenever, whenever you say, wow, I'm, Lord, you've given me a vision to go farther with you. I've got a desire. I've got a, I'm going to go farther with you, right? There's a storm coming, probably. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it just it shows up. What's driving that storm? It's opposition. It's demonic opposition somehow, some way, right? Really? Could the devil stir up a physical storm? Yeah, he actually could. He actually could. And uh, we know that, that this storm came from the devil because Jesus rebuked it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and it, you know, it, it wasn't just uh, a, 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 what, a, a coincidence of weather. It wasn't. It wasn't. And, you know, and if you, if you want to look at it that way, you'll still get something good out of it. But I don't. I think that there was something demonic behind this. And, yeah, when, when the Lord calls you to, to go with him, it will be challenged at some level. It will be challenged. All right. So, uh, in fact, <laughs> I heard somebody talk one time about uh, if you're in a storm, first try and discern what, what the origin of the storm is. Because uh, everybody heard of a prophet named Jonah in the Old Testament too? Yeah, and God called him to prophesy to Nineveh, and he didn't. He ran away, right? And a storm came after him too. But that storm was from God. <laughs> right? The storm was to get him back right? on, on track, right? But this particular storm was demonic in its origin, right? So sometimes you want to make sure, you're, you, you know, what's the origin of this particular storm? But uh, Anyway, I thought that was funny. Yeah, so, uh, so the storm comes, but it says Jesus is in the stern asleep on a pillow. <laughs> That's awesome. And how can he be asleep in, in a storm? Because, you know, the boat's already tossing and, you know, turning. He's, compl- he's sleeping like a baby. <laughs> Apparently, he's got so much peace on the inside. And this, this, exactly what I'm talking about, the Ark of the Covenant, Holy of Holies, throne room reality inside of him is so real the dominion, the authority, the promise, the safety, the, you know what I'm saying? It's all so real inside of him. It's like, no, this is not a problem. <laughs> like, yeah. and, and you know that you're growing spiritually when something that used to keep you awake for hours, now you just go, no. <laughs> That's spiritual growth, quite honestly. You know, because when you eat, let something eat your lunch, right, <laughs> you're, you get it. All right, so Jesus is totally asleep. And then they wake him up in a total panic and said, teacher, obviously you don't care that we're all going to die. <laughs> and that's not true, of course, but they, they have no faith, right? They're, they're convinced they're going to die. And the fact that Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side doesn't mean anything to them. It's like, we're going to die. So. But how many of us have been there? <laughs> me too. Absolutely, me too. <laughs> And then Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And so what, what he does is really essentially he recognizes that this is demonic in order to stop him. And he's like, that's no problem, you know, because we're going to the other side. The Father's with me. I've got the throne room, dominion, presence of the Father inside of me. We're all good. And so he just releases what's inside of him. No. Stop. <laughs> And the storm goes, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it stops, right? And whatever demon was behind it, even Satan himself, runs away. And there's a great calm. Jesus released what was inside of himself. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make there. He's carrying the dominion inside of himself in partnership with the Father, the kingdom reality, right, inside of himself. And he just releases it. But he said to them, to the disciples, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have, what? No, no faith. faith. Oh, that's hard. That's hard. Well, if you're one of the disciples, right? Because I've been there. I've been a disciple who got into a big panic about some storm I was in, and I thought that was the end, you know? And then you read this, and Jesus goes, <laughs> where's your faith? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Right? Ouch. Why are you so fearful? We're fearful because we've been spiritual orphans all of our lives in this world. We didn't know you. We were slaves to sin, spiritual orphans. That's why we're fearful. I mean, that really is the real answer. 
You know, now we're, now we're, in our case, now we're born again children of God. We're not orphans anymore, but we still think like orphans until we learn to think differently, right? We think like we're alone until we learn to think differently, right? We think that we have no support until we learn to think differently. And that's progressing into that Holy of Holies, Ark of the Covenant, mercy seat, throne room, partnership, union, and communion with God. Right? And as we begin to take that in and it becomes reality inside of us, then we're not so fearful anymore. Right? Then we say, huh, there's another storm. Cool. <laughs> right? I'm still going across. Right? There's another storm that's going to that's gonna whimper and, and run away. Right? Yeah, yeah. You do change. You do change to, it, I'm not just a sinner forgiven going to heaven. No, Jesus is raising up disciples. We may start off as sheep with a shepherd, right? And to some degree, we're always sheep with a shepherd, right? But, but he's raising up disciples. He's raising up people that he said, speak to the mountain and tell it to, you know, cast into the sea. Speak to the tree and tell it to be uprooted and cast into the sea. Speak to this. Speak to the storm, right? He says, how is it that you have no faith? He's trying to raise up disciples that have some awareness of, of faith and, and authority in partnership with God. Now, at this particular point, I don't think I would blame the disciples for having no faith because I've been born again and I've still been in the situation and reacted the same way they did, right? <laughs> so and they're not even born again yet and they're not really sure still who Jesus is. So, you know, I kind of, I'd give them a pass. <laughs> And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? <laughs> They're still, the answer is, is, right? is he God? Is he a man? They don't, they're still not quite getting it, right? Jump back to uh, 40 just for a moment. When Jesus said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You know what? Um, he, uh, I, 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 I've, um, ooh. People can interpret this in different ways. What would Jesus expect of us? And there's some perfectly legitimate answers that people could disagree on and still be okay, right? Uh, one answer would simply be they could have woken Jesus up with faith and said, hey, save us. We know you can do it, but can you take care of this, right? And that would have been faith, wouldn't it? That would have been faith, absolutely. Uh, another one, if you really want to go a step farther, is Jesus had already been training these guys to cast out demons and heal the sick, hadn't he? He'd been doing it, right? And so maybe, maybe if they were really on the ball, they could have said, hey, maybe, maybe we should speak to it in his name. And, you know, I mean, that would have been like huge, in, enormous faith on their behalf. They didn't go, they didn't do either of those two things. They just panicked and freaked out, right? Oh, we're going to die. Either of those things would have been better than freaking out and panicking. <laughs> right? Either would have been better. But, so I think in our progress, like, it's, it's, it's faith when we simply get to the point where if the storm comes your way, you go, you know what? I'm going to be okay. God's with me. I'm going to be okay. That's faith. It is faith. It's even more faith if you say, you know, in this particular one, I think God wants me to rebuke it. <laughs> I think he wants me to speak to this thing. <laughs> that's even more faith. Right? Don't do it presumptuously, but if you know that this is one of those storms that's brewing to stop you and, you know, devil's behind it and, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's nudging you to use some authority, go for it. <laughs> Speak to it, yeah. But either way, either response would have been better than no faith. But again, I give them a pass because I've been there. <laughs> oh, Hallelujah. Bottom line, I think he's, the Lord is really trying to bring us to this place spiritually where we become aware of union with him, communion, partnership with him, living inside of us. Everything that God is, all of his resources, his throne, his dominion, all is living inside of us, his love, his companionship, all living inside of us right now. Okay? Jesus wasn't insecure, was he? He wasn't like a person who was really insecure. You know, he didn't walk into a room and say, I hope somebody here likes me. I hope somebody here accepts me. He didn't do any of that stuff, did he? Why do we do that stuff? Why do people do that stuff? Because we're not aware of this union that we have with God, right? We have it, but we're not aware of it yet. We're not living out of it yet. And so we walk into a room and say, I hope somebody likes me here. Oh, man. But you grow in Christ and you don't have to do that anymore. You walk into the room and you bring it. You're the person who walks into the room and you bring love to people. You bring acceptance to people. You bring faith to people. You bring encouragement. You're the one who brings it. 
right? Instead of the one looking for it, you're the one who brings it. Where does it come from? This, this inner partnership with God, the, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant inside of you, the, the manifested glory presence of God inside of you, right? And you're on the throne with him and his thronerism inside of you, and you, you get it, you get it. Uh, that's what God's wanting us to grow into. Even if it's step by step, and if it takes a while to get there, amen? All right. I think I got it across today. Did I get it across? All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. All right, let's stand together. Thank you. Mm. Ah, hallelujah. So, yeah, any instrumental would be cool or uh, anything. Yeah, that would be nice. Thanks, Todd. Hallelujah. Let's, uh, so what I want to do, again, right now, it's not just a dismissing prayer. What I want to do for the next just a uh, couple of minutes at least is invite... Holy Spirit to come and reveal more of this to you, for him to come and breathe it into you, the revelation of it, the reality of it, and make it part of you right now. Hallelujah. So Holy Spirit, welcome. In Jesus' name, we invite you. We acknowledge and recognize you're already inside of us, you're already with us, but I invite your manifested presence to come begin to speak to hearts, begin to reveal to us the reality of what we're called to. Called to walk in in an awareness and a partnership with God living inside of us. We're called to an awareness of your dominion inside of us, your resources inside of us, your flow of love, endless, limitless love inside of us. Hallelujah. Just like Jesus modeled it for us. Thank you, God, you're now living inside of us. We are your tabernacle. We are your temple. We carry the glory, the presence. We carry the resurrection, life, and power. We're learning what we carry. We're learning how to release it. We're learning how to walk in it, God. Most of the time, we're still like little children, just barely glimpsing. God, you're, you're calling us deeper, deeper into union with you, into communion with you, into awareness of your presence with us and in us all the time, God. Thank you, Lord. We're not just forgiven sinners with a ticket to heaven, God, but we're disciples of Jesus, members of his body. We're branches connected to the vine. We're one spirit with you, Lord. And you are living in us and living through us teaching us how to let you live in us and live through us, to live in partnership with you, God. God, I pray that this, that the revelation of it will grow in each of us. Hmm. Just in your mind's eye, just kind of take a little trip through that tabernacle enter into the tabernacle of Moses by the altar of sacrifice and then the, the wash basin. And then you step into the holy place. And there's the lampstand on the left. There's the table of showbread on the right. There's the altar of incense right ahead of you. But then you pass through one more veil. Move right on in because just like Moses, who is a symbol of you and me in the new covenant, you have the right to, to enter in because Jesus made the way. Because of the shed blood of Jesus, you have the right to enter boldly into the throne room of God. And as you pass into the Holy of Holies, what you realize, it's not just the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. You realize really that that's a symbol for the throne room of God. It's a symbol of the throne of God. And there is your, your relationship with God. And there you are seated with God at his right hand. And there you are. That's the place where God says, here I meet with, here, with you. Here I speak with you. Here I communicate with you. Here you sit with me. 
Here you, you enter into union and communion. You enter into oneness and relationship. And as you become aware of this and you enter into this and you walk around, you carry it with you. You carry it inside of you. You're never alone. You're never alone. The Father loves you. The Father loves you, His Son, His daughter. And everything you say and do can begin to be more and more motivated by God living inside of you. You don't have to feel alone. You don't have to feel unloved. You don't have to feel insecure. You don't have to have an orphan heart. God's your Father living right inside of you. His kingdom right inside of you. His throne right inside of you. He wants that to affect how you think, what you believe, what you expect, how you relate to other people. Holy Spirit, yeah, just breathe revelation into everybody here. <laughs> just take your place there at His side, at His right hand on the throne. Take your place there. See yourself there with Him. Realize that wherever you go, wherever you walk, that throne room is right inside of you right now. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen. God bless y'all. I love you. Thanks for being here tonight.